Welcome to Local Distortion. On this podcast, I'll be talking to the best up-and-coming independent artists and bands. I am your host, Daniel Kirk. So my guest this week is Adi Aska. Thank you for joining me. Hello. Before we talk about your acoustic project, I would firstly like to mention your other projects and accomplishments. I understand you write and compose contemporary classical music. Well, yeah. Sounds a bit nerdy when you say... <laughs> it sounds very, it's very posh. Yeah, contemporary classical, it's contemporary, darling, contemporary. Um, it's basically, I've gone to university. Um, I say university, it's conservatoire, which sounds even more posh. And wow, own. I've never um, even heard of that. It's that posh. Yes, uh, people get confused. It's not a conservatory. It's not full of plants. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like a... It's a small university that's completely geared towards music. Um, my one particularly is geared towards music and drama. But yes, the the things that we compose are traditionally contemporary, like classical music. All the stuff that goes beep, 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 like random <laughs> random notes. That's a, that's a yeah. bit of a that's a bit of a stereotype. We do compose. It's not that's not what contemporary classical music is, but that's what everyone assumes yeah. that it is. And you yeah. do have some samples on your website, don't you? Of your Yes, unfortunately. Yes, I do. My website is full of all different sorts of music because I just stick my finger in many pies, as they say. So there is a contemporary classical section to that for anyone who's interested. Speaking of your other pies that you have, you've Mm -hmm. previously produced electronica tracks. Yeah, that's basically basically where I got into Reason, the... Uh, computer software reason so that's mainly geared towards synthesizers and stuff I know that the new version does record people now it can record audio as well but when I first started out it was just synths and uh, I also got into dubstep at that time so I was basically having a lot of fun with wobs (laughs) and like that and I think it actually was really good I went into SoundCloud and actually had a really good time it was a really nice community there um but that was quite a few years back now I haven't really I've got a few tracks similar to it that are coming out but it's a bit of one of those phases that you kind of go through I think oh okay that's fair enough lastly you're currently with a full band called Near Moments could you Briefly tell us a description of the band and what it's about. So the band is uh, described as alternative rock uh, based with with female vocals, main vocals and electric violin. I guess you could say it's similar to that of Mallory Knox, Don Broco. We get Paramore a lot. People say, oh my gosh, you sound like Paramore. And things like that. Because you're a female singer, obviously. Yeah, that that is quite a trope. But to be honest, I guess our voices are fairly similar in tone. Although I try to have more of an English accent, and she's obviously got the typical American accent, seeing as she's from America. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Yeah. But that's good. It's nice. I get to rock out on stage and flip my hair back and forth and get awesome photos of my hair, like, in the air and stuff. So So you currently juggle that band with doing your acoustic stuff as well yeah it's it's uh yes it's tricky i get when i get waves so one minute i'll be doing the band stuff the next minute i'll be doing my own stuff if one is you know quiet then the other one will not be quiet yes (laughs) i try and balance them both so would you say your acoustic stuff is currently your main focus at this point in time yes but no one really knows what goes on in the background with musicians and usually when a a musician's quiet on on social media or in general it's one of two things either are they having a lovely holiday which i don't ever get or they are planning uh away borrowing away um making things so i've got things going on in both in both those areas but adieska is definitely doing more gigs and stuff at the moment and is more prominent on the scene, I guess. Yeah. Yes. But let's get back to your solo project. So let's talk about Daydreamer, because it has quite a nice story behind it, which is on your website, a brief yeah. description of it. But yeah, if you'd like to elaborate on that. Because I've been writing music for, for a while now and been performing since, I don't know, 2011 or something. Daydreamer is one of the earliest songs that I ever wrote. So it basically took years for me to actually decide to record it. And then when I recorded it, I was in the middle of my degree. So it's taken a number of years to actually come to fruition. Um, but now it's out there. So it's really good. And I think it, it's great because the actual song itself reflects that time of my life where I was kind of just daydreaming away and always wanting to kind of just uh, relax for a bit and take it easy and focus on the things that I want to focus on and 
I think one of the lines and wouldn't it be easier letting go, letting go and stuff. And it's basically just about just having a bit of a break and taking a breath of fresh air. And, you know, I hadn't, I didn't have time to do that. So getting that song out there and releasing it was my version of just letting, having a bit of a relax and taking the time out to do things I wanted to do. So yeah, my lovely friend, Christopher Bone, he, uh, him and I have known each other for years and years and years. And we went to university, uh, you know, not university, uh, we went to sixth form together and he's done a fantastic job. Really, really, really good. I think he's on Vimeo. He's got his own videos as well. So if anyone wants to check those out, they're awesome. Christopher Bone. Um, yeah, check it out. It's really, really nice, really sweet, very country so where can listeners check out the video? It's on your website and It's YouTube. on my website and it's on YouTube. You basically just have to Google for Adieska so you'll see how it's spelled and stuff on the podcast. But um, my website's just .com at the end and on YouTube. I think I have the username Adieska. If not, Google it and that will actually pop up. Hopefully you'll see my face. <laughs> I, think it, I think it does come up straight away on YouTube. Actually. Okay, good. So oh, good, good, I think, good. I think you're good there. Tell me what you think are the pros and cons to being a solo artist. Uh, I think the pros of being a solo artist is uh, basically you can focus on the things that you want to do. You can do it the way you want to do it. Uh, You know, it's it's the balance of... I know that the, the cons, the pros and cons, it's always a balance. So whilst being on your own is great because you get to focus on yourself at the same time, it's nice to have other people to take the weight off sometimes and and pitch in. And, you know, creatively, it's nice because you don't have to argue with anyone. You can just basically say, yep, this is what I want to do. But at the same time, having, you know, more brains are better, you know, two brains are better than one and that whole thing. So it's basically the way you've got to look at it is you can just kind of pick out the pros from being on your own, I guess. But then there are pros and cons, swings and roundabouts. So am I making yeah. sense? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You said, obviously, it's just you. Is it hard for you on your own to build up a following and do most of the work yourself? A tricky question because you say, is it hard? But it depends because some people find it easier than others. Some people have a great network of friends and family. Yeah, so and it makes it easier, obviously, <laughs> if, if you are hooked up with connections. And some, some people are, are kind of more isolated than others. And I yeah. say, as long as you kind of, being a solo artist doesn't mean you have to be on your own. You, there are so many opportunities that a person can do and, you know, contacts that you can make. And just because you're, you, you know, solo artist can mean just, just having it as, you know, Adieska is me, but I actually do get other people involved to play the music. So, you know, bassist or a cajon player slash drummer involved, you know, you get these people involved and then they tell their friends, you know, their family get involved. They're excited about the project. It's just it's just who you talk to, I guess. And trying to get the other people involved will get other people interested. What artists inspire your songwriting? I would say every every single artist should every inspire. Every single artist. Yes. It's, uh, there's a book that I read, um, a very small book because I don't tend to read that much. So I have a small book with big print um, called Steal Like an Artist. I would really, I can't remember who wrote it because I think I've lent it to someone, but Steal Like an Artist is such a, such a good book that just tells you how to make the best of being creative. And one of the lines in there is that an original artist copies from a hundred people whilst, you know, a person who steals someone's work will copy from one person. Yeah, I've heard that before as well. Yeah. To think of it, that's, that's kind of jogged my memory because I think they said that to us when I was in college doing graphic design ah. and they said, you can't. You can't obviously rip someone's work off. If you take inspirations from loads of different artists and combine it all together, yeah. then that actually becomes an original piece. So it's, that, it's yeah. like say the, met- the the you know the analogy would be is if you wanted to make a painting and you basically got two artists' paintings chopped it in half and then stuck it together, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to recognise each artist. Whereas yeah. if you've got tiny tiny bits of paper from lots lots of artists and collaged it together to make another new different thing, then that becomes an original piece of work. But I don't want to. I don't want to like slide off your conversation. Uh, your question, sorry. So the people who really, really inspire me, people like Kate Bush because I love her type of, type of songwriting. David Bowie, the way he writes lyrics and and you know creates them, he can chop them up and put them together, and it, all, it can all be quite interesting. The Beatles obviously have a great amount of. The great thing about the Beatles is I think is they do so. They've done so many different types of songs songwriting, not only because of. Uh, 
you know, McCartney and Lennon having different approaches, but generally because of their whole career going through different different scenes and stuff. Um, who else, who else, who else? But yeah, no, those are, those are the main ones that quickly come to mind. They're not my, obviously, like, like my favourite, favourite artists, but in songwriting terms, they've done a good job, I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's, that's a really good wide range of people. So yeah, you briefly kind of touched on that at the end. So my next question is, what artists inspire you as a person, just in general? As a person, I would I would say people like Amy Lee from Evanescence, I think has done a good job because I think she was fairly, not young, young, but fairly young when she started off. And I think she did a good job with what she did. She stuck to her roots and, and did all that stuff. But then she also, she now that Evanescence is a bit more in the shadows, she's still kind of putting out the odd bit and bob and she's doing really, really well for herself and things. And I think the same thing for, you know, Sorry to go back to Paramore, but Hayley Williams, I think, has done the same thing. She was originally going to be signed as a solo artist um, where she was just going to do pop music or whatever. And she said, no, 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 I want to have a band. I want to do um, Paramore. So they signed all of them. And it's really ironic now that she's the only original member left in Paramore and they've all kind of kind of gone off to do their own things, which is fair enough. But she's still going out there and, you know, doing different things and stuff. And I think it's so easy to take an artist and pigeonhole them and put them in one spot and say, this is who you are, this is the music that you're doing, and this is what you'll do for the rest of your life. You know, Mod- Madonna didn't think that. Beyonce definitely didn't think that. It's, it's people who go out and they do different things and they have fun and, and enjoy all the different, you know, people that they can meet and things that they can create. And I think that's probably the inspiration that I've taken from those sorts of artists. So my next question is, do you have a day job? What line of work are you in, if so? I don't have a job in the typical sense of, you know, like I don't work in an office or anything like that. I, I do do jobs, though, like teaching teaching music. I've got one-on-one lessons teaching. Um, I've got... I'm currently actually working on a holiday course. I'm a course leader for two courses. So that's um, a thing called youth television where kids kind of take big cameras, big expensive cameras, and they make their own films, which is quite cool. And then the other one is called Studio Sounds. It's where kids come along and they basically sing songs. They get to sing a group song and a solo song, and I record them, and and then that's it. But the rest of the time, the whole of this year at least, I've been doing just freelance work. So uh, obviously I've got Near Moments, I've got Adieska stuff, so that pays a bit of money sometimes. Uh, I'm in, I play violin and mandolin for a lovely lady called Lilac Shear. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, kind of Americana folky sort of stuff, um, mainly based, she's based in South London, around Bromley and West Wickham and stuff like that. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, studio work. Basically, yeah, I've just, uh, and I've got, you know, I help out my students as well. Um, so I get paid for session work and doing things in studio and playing the violin for people sometimes. <laughs> wow. So you're like the first guest who actually pretty much does music full time as a living it's really tough i mean because i know people who are trying to have music session as their main source of income and it is possible but like most things in life you have to kind of work up a database and you have to work up uh, you know clients and business and there are so many different things that people can do but it's just really hard to kind of get it going and that's why people take on um small time jobs and 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 things like that i'm very lucky because i I'd had i had waitressing a lot uh, last year and the year before so i did a lot of waitressing and that was slightly soul crushing yeah. but at the same time at the same time i got to meet a load of awesome people i got to meet um stephen fry i got to touch his the back of his neck his sweaty nape of his neck so i managed to do that why did uh, you touch his neck <laughs> um so basically so i was on a 12-hour shift at the roundhouse in camden okay. and i was on the cloakroom and i never ever ever fangirl like ever unless it's someone like royal blood or madonna who i also got to see at the brit awards and nearly fainted um but anyway is that the go- one where she fell over Yes, I got to see it live and everything. <laughs> it was really horrifying because I had a massive yeah. thump and it, we, I was watching and there was a massive thump and she fell over. But she, she's a strong woman, so kudos mm-hmm. to her for getting up and continuing. But yeah, yeah. back to Stephen Fry. He was at um, this labour convention at the Roundhouse and he came over to the cloakroom girls and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, but can someone please fix my collar for me? And I just like bashed past the other girls. I was like, yes, yes, no, I can help. And got to twist his collar and... He was a little bit sweaty. That's why I'll end the story. <laughs> but yes, that, so waitressing. That's an awesome story. Yeah, waitressing's had got, got a lot of good stories from that. 
but doing things like that and obviously other other sessions and performing in the panto my local panto getting money from shows and things like that that I, I basically just save 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 and then from that I can actually spend it on you know a little bit of rent that teaching as well makes a lot of money teaching one-on-one um made a lot more money than it did waitressing and that just helps um keep everything kind of afloat but it is super super tough like super super tough um because you know it's a very competitive industry there are a lot of people out there you have to kind of sell yourself a lot you have to kind of make sure people think that you're worth their time basically definitely so you obviously do a lot in your free time like teach and stuff and you also busk in london yeah i wouldn't really call it free free time i mean my free time is uh well is very minimum but uh in uh yes i do teaching um mainly on thursdays a little bit on friday a little bit on saturdays it's good it's flexible because it means if i have a gig i can just say look i'm gonna have to miss this week or something and then busking wise there's a competition in london which they've uh i think it's kind of finished for this year but they should hopefully do it next year. And they've opened it out. It used to be just for London, people living in London. And now they've opened it out. So if anyone's interested, I think it's just called Gigs, G-I-G-S. Um, or it's a festival of London Big Busk or something like that. And basically, you just go out to different places and, and but they just set up busking spots for you. And I managed to do it. I did it last year. And I've done it this year as well with my boyfriend, Henry. And I managed to get a temporary busking license out of it last year. So I can just basically go out and book a slot and have a busk and hopefully get a little bit of cash and a little bit of promotion from it. So, yeah, you you obviously need to apply for a licence to do it in London. I'm not sure about any other towns or, or how they yeah. normally do it, but definitely in London it's a licence thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm quite clued up on the whole busking licences now because um, when I not only... It's very different in London because London's pretty much like a extra it's a whole new country so the different boroughs have different rules so i know that you have to pay you have to apply and pay for a license in camden now it used to be free but it's quite cheap to do it if you're an unamplified solo artist as soon as you start getting amplification or other people involved the price goes up but you can usually make that back because camden's pretty good places like south bank covent garden you know the really popular places they they actually do uh, I think auditions and I'm not sure how um, or you have to especially apply for it and I'm not sure how often they do those the tube on the other hand is a bit annoying because they only really do it every three years and they just did one which I missed because I'm an idiot <laughs> but I managed to get a temporary license from the busking competition so that's okay but yes you need to just keep your eye out for it and as soon as it becomes available just apply 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 because the busking the tube one is the best thing ever I would really say anyone who's who's near London who can get to London it's really really good because it's you know when you're on the street people are distracted people are you know it's great as well being on the street but in the tube it's if you know where the spots are you can get a lot of money from it and it's really and people do stop and listen sometimes which is really really nice yeah they sort of like they've marked out the floor now on most tube stations something where the artist will stand quickly if you don't mind me asking how much roughly is the license depending on what you do uh for it depends where uh, where you're talking about because it's different for different places um just just ones that you've actually paid for that, that you've i haven't had. i haven't paid for for any to be honest um oh are they like more the like exclusive spots that you sort of have to pay for them but how does how does the no. license work is it like so, you pay for a so, year or I, I, it, it's a really tough question because it changes you have to my advice for anyone who wants to busk is to go online and they you have to input the particular borough or particular location it is that it's right. in and then you have to pay i think places outside of london i don't think you you actually have to pay for many places to get a busking license i think you just have to either check up on their rules um and where uh, you can busk or you do have to actually apply but you don't have to pay any money in london the only place i've really looked up was camden and i think it was something around maybe a bit under 10 pounds for an amplified performer and then as you're getting towards amplified and group performances it was like 30 40 quid or something i think this is just from my memory but with the tube with with covent garden and the tube and stuff i don't think you have to pay i think it's all based on auditions so I think if you're if you're savvy, you can get by without having to pay any expenses, and you can just try and find the places that are free. And there's only a few places where you have to really pay. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. That's great.
What are some of your highlights from your acoustic shows that you've played this year? Favourite places you've visited and the best shows you've played? Mm, that's a toughie. There was a gig I did on the 9th of April at the Ent Shed in Bedford, which was very special. Uh, it was very, very well organised and I had uh, a cohen player and a bassist with me, which is great. Uh, but the interesting thing about this gig, and I like all... I like all shows that I do, whether it's, you know, on a big, massive stage, you know, in a pub with lots and lots of people standing around drinking or if they're sitting down. This one was different because everyone was sat and it was like a classical concert and it was so, so quiet. And when I was talking in the microphone to people, I I found myself like whispering. It was really, really bizarre because I was a bit nervous and everyone was really, really quiet. So I was very, very quiet. But um, it was really nice. And I had everyone come up to me afterwards and say lovely things. And I think that one just sticks out in my mind a lot just because of how different it was from the other gigs that I've done. Um, Having said that, I did another gig that was, again, in Bedford at a place called 44 Harper Street. And, you know, it was uh, run by a guy called Jez Brown. And I had a lot of people. It was a very intimate show. But I had my parents there. I had my boyfriend there. Um, The guy who's recently been recording me in the studio, he was there. Uh, just a bunch of other people I know, good friends were there and stuff. And I performed a few new songs and basically poured my heart out a bit. <laughs> and it was a really nice, intimate show. It's like one of those things that you wish you could do just in your lounge, but it'd be a bit weird. Like if I just did a show for myself in my own lounge. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a nice little uh, self-indulgent moment there. Do you have any more shows coming up in the next few months? So a lot of the festival season is over for me now. Um, I've had most show, I've had a lot of shows over the week over the weekends. You know, once every Saturday and Sunday. I've got, uh, I think, it, in September time, early September, I've got a gig in Worcester, a, a gig uh, where I was in Leicester, and in Baldock. Uh, sounds of Bulldog. Uh They're all still being roughly confirmed and information should be out very, very soon. Um, but if you want to find out anything more about my shows, you'll find a little tab on my website, adiesca.com. I do have a mailing list, which I don't put out loads of emails. It's just every now and then when something big happens, I'll let people know what's going on. Um, or my Facebook page as well, facebook.com forward slash Adieska. And I'll just let you know. So, yeah. Awesome. Now, I've seen you perform live and as well as play your own songs, you like to throw a couple of covers in there in your own unique style. What are some of your favourite covers you like to play? So, favourite covers. These are the covers that I've pretty much just been playing for years and years. Decode by Paramore. I've always had a soft spot and it's really, really fun vocally. It's quite challenging. I like the songs that, I like the covers that are challenging to sing um and that has like quite a high chorus i put in it um so that's one that i've played a lot uh what else uh i really really like the song um my house by paris pvris which is a female alternative rock band um but she just has such a great voice and it's just such a nice she's just such a good melodic writer and i just love i just love the song really like the guitar work that i do for it as well it's just really really fun to do and then recently i've been playing things like heathens by um 21 pilots and i think i was going on about a few other songs earlier but yeah that 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 song it's just every now and then you come across a song that you kind of can't stop listening to and you kind of listen to it listen to it until you get a bit sick of it and i'm counting the days until i get sick of this one but i still haven't seen the film so that it's going to be in suicide squad but um when i saw you live you were saying that you weren't really into it but you kind of like that song so you decided to I wasn't, cover it. I wasn't really in I'm not really into 21 Pilots. I've never really listened right, to their right. stuff. However, I had a big listening session the other day and I feel really rude because <laughs> they're actually really really good and I just don't know why I never listened to 21 Pilots. I don't, I have no clue why. Um and I don't know why I was just putting it down in my mind because it's it's really really good music and uh yeah, the, su- the whole Suicide Squad film. Yeah, I was going to see that yesterday uh, in Shepherd's Bush, but it's so expensive in Shepherd's Bush. And I just thought, no, no, I'm going to go home and watch it. So I still have not seen it, but who knows? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, just... I need to go see that film as well this week at some point. I just have to do it before, you know, when it stops playing in the cinemas and then you're just there on the website crying because it doesn't show up on Cineworld or something. And I'm yeah, like, everywhere's so packed at the moment. It's Yeah, I did try at the weekend. But... 
that's the thing weekend days this too bu- too busy too yeah. busy yeah. definitely what are your future plans or projects that you currently have on the horizon so i've been in the studio recently and i've got five songs that i've recorded they're all slightly different and i haven't figured out a massive plan as yet because i just want to test the waters and see how it goes so i'll be sending them off to a few people and just seeing what they think but i'm hoping to to release a few more singles videos things like that um just because you know that's what we do i want to show people my work and get people excited and yeah um apart from that just I'm, i'm going back to university next year so i'll be in london a lot more so I'm hoping just to test the waters more next year. And then after that, the world will be my oyster and I'll have to decide what I'm going to do with myself. And <laughs> yeah, that I'm worried about. But yeah, it should be fine. You said to me earlier, you've previously released a few a few acoustic songs. Are they all available on the same EP or are they just dig- digital downloads? How do they're you... All just, they're all just singles at the moment. I mean, uh, the way I see the world at the moment, everything's kind of labelled and put in boxes and everything. And and when it comes to my music, I want to really spend time on each song because each song means a lot to me. I don't think I'm at that stage yet where uh, I can release an album or an EP. I feel like they need to have some sort of connection. And although, although they are written all by me and performed by me, and that is a pretty big connection, I'm talking more about kind of all the songs being about a certain topic or, you know, a certain point in my life or... I don't know. I just I just think that online at the moment, if I just release a few singles at a time and then just see, you know, maybe after a while I'll, I'll put it on a CD and have a compilation of my songs on a CD and that'll be nice to give out at gigs. But until then, it's just not financially feasible to put two songs on one cd and i don't know maybe i could put them on a memory stick and sell those (laughs) yeah yeah maybe but yeah it's it's kind of like an old school way of thinking because i remember when i was about maybe 14 15 and the internet was sort of taking off bands were just releasing downloadable singles they'd even produce videos for them and it wasn't on cd it wasn't on any other format you just literally downloaded it and it was like only available for a certain amount of time so you had to like you know get there quick and, and get it and yeah i just i think maybe bands should revert back to that kind of that thinking really and that way because it gets people excited it's just a different for, way of doing things i think i think for bands that are definitely kind of starting out you need to decide what your music needs i mean it's all well and good saying well i'm this or artist so i need to release an album or you know people think i'm really professional if i release a big fat album but you know it takes a lot of effort to get people who've never heard of you who doesn't who don't know anything about you to just listen to one song and you know if you spend a lot of effort recording lots and lots of songs and then it doesn't quite work out because you have to test the water with these things um and then you release this big batch of songs you've basically kind of just i don't know it's 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 completely up to to the individual to decide what's right for them and what's not right but i just i just feel like every song to me is very very special and i need to give each song that special amount of attention and to give people that special amount of attention to be like look i like this song it's this sort of song if you like this sort of music listen to this song not just not just listen to my whole album like here's my album there you go sit down and spend you know half an hour listening to this you know, it, it takes three minutes to listen to one song. Yeah. It takes a lot of time to listen to a whole, a whole album. So if you can just plug people a few songs at a time, actually, I think they'll listen to it more. I don't know. That's my that's my intellectual thinking on it, anyway. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point because a lot of bands, they do rush things. They want to release like a four or five track EP straight away and chuck their music out there. And like yeah. you said, if, if people only like one song, you know, you, you've wasted a lot of time recording those other songs that people really aren't that into and you didn't really put that much focus and attention on because you just wanted to fill a CD and look like you're busy and look like you're yeah. turning stuff out. I mean, an album and an EP can have its own uh, its own uses and effect. I mean, why? if you ask yourself, why, why do you listen to a whole album? I usually stick on a whole album when I've listened to one song that I really like from the artist. And then later they might release an EP and I think, oh, I'll check out more of their own songs. But if they haven't kind of plugged one already, I, I don't really know anything about them. It's the same thing with 21 Pilots. I never had the desire to listen to, you know, lots of their music. And then this one track has come out 
and I only listened to it because I was interested in the film that it was going to be in. This all sounds very, very shallow, but it kind of like, you know, it, it makes sense because I've listened to that one song and now I've listened to more of their songs. Um, but having an album itself, you know, I listen to albums when I see them on in the background and they're there as nice music and stuff. And if you can create a whole project with an album that does really does that well, like you can give it to people and say, look, stick this on in the background. You don't even have to listen to it that seriously. Just stick it on, see what you think. And I think that's, you know, a different approach. And I think probably, you know, works better. But it's, again, it's up to the individual and what they want to do. But you're right. I think I think people need to spend more time and care and attention rather than just getting really, really excited. It's so hard. It's so hard it for is, composers yeah. and artists to kind of sit on their work. Like me, I find it so hard. And then when it actually gets to the point where you actually have to release something, you don't get cold feet and you're like, oh, I don't know if it's any good mm. and stuff. It's a cruel, cruel industry. <laughs> it is, definitely. And bringing up that point about liking a full album, I will admit that... I've always had this issue with Foo Fighters where I've never really dug like a whole album and I could listen to it all the way through. Like there's always been great songs on there, but mm. there's five great songs maybe on an album or four great songs, but the rest of the album I'll just skip to, to get to those songs. And obviously I was really happy when they released their greatest hits because I was just like, that that should have been just one album. You know, that could have been, yeah. you know, an album, album and a half, you know what I mean? That, that's just my opinion. I'm sure there's people out there who love their albums and can listen to them all the way through. But, but just think about the B-sides, you know? Yeah. People still release B-sides. And I think it's completely up to, you know, what people's tastes are. Because uh, a lot of people, um, you know, take Muse, for example. A lot of people don't particularly like Muse. A lot of people love Muse. I, I love do not Muse. like Muse. <laughs> okay, a lot of people don't like Muse. <laughs> um, I mean, why, why don't you like Muse? Just out of curiosity. I mean, I appreciate how talented they are. And mm. they're amazing musicians, but it it just doesn't appeal to me, and I don't think they're that special. And is it, is it, is the it special treatment music? they do get kind of bugs yeah. me that other bands are not getting attention that they probably deserve. Is it the style of music as well? Do you think? Like, do you just not like the style of music, or? Well, saying that recently, I think it was like maybe one or two albums ago, I did like a couple of tracks on there. Mm. because they kind of did change a bit and it wasn't full-on Muse. <laughs> so what I could, like... Because they have, if you listen, they've actually got some B-sides that no one really knows about, and it's a lot more kind of rockier. Like, I listened yeah. to it, and I first didn't realise it was Muse. And I think that's the point. I think artists, when they when they release B-sides or they release uh, another track that isn't perhaps, uh, like, a main track of what they're used to doing, I think it's them, again, testing the waters. And yeah. that's when you get the things like, oh, I don't really like that song. That's them being like, well, we're just going to release it anyway. But you never know. That could be a really big song. And then that's when people, you know, they release an album, and then later on they re-release one of the songs from the album as a single because it's done so well. Yeah, definitely. And they think, oh, that'll pull more people in. It's all it's all business. It's all such a business strategy, I think. One it's one thing that I will have a little gripe about is that there was a band, I won't mention them because I always talk about them on the podcast, but it's just because they were like one of my favourite bands. <laughs> but they really irritated me when they re-released their first EP. It had the whole EP live as well as an extended track list. And it also had new b-sides but what they'd done is they'd got some old b-sides that had already been released on singles and things like that and they just changed the name but they they were the exact same recording and really I, yeah oh, and i felt sorry. robbed i felt yeah. robbed because you know it wasn't a cheap ep it was like nine to ten pounds gosh there wasn't and you really anything new music it. if it wasn't new yeah the, i mean the live recordings were shit and they just beefed up the drums because originally they sounded quite teeny on the release so they've just put more bass in it and it's just like, yeah, I, I feel robbed, really. That's the problem as well. You need to be very, very careful what you promise certain people, you know, when you say online, oh, I'm going to release this song. But then if anyone, like, releases it for free somewhere else, it's like you feel cheated for buying that. That's why I just hate, like, yeah, the whole kind yeah. of, you know, music piracy and things like that. It just doesn't make sense, you know. People spend time and money on it. But again, again going back to the, that artist, I think it's just all a bit corporate, isn't it? A bit like they've kind of sussed out some sort of way of doing it. Mm. it is interesting how what people's perception of what bands actually put out there and how it actually is in real life mm. so you know mm. for instance 
there's this thing about royal blood and then how you know they have this badass like look about them and you know who knows they drink blah blah, blah. but actually <laughs> it's like you know they're on their rider they'll have you know green tea and stuff and you yeah. know lots of healthy foods and you, you know that rock and roll style although it's still there isn't quite i think what's behind the scenes but that's such a shame though that yeah. you had to you know your one of your favorite artists done that has done that you know that's the responsibility that i think some people have not just you know music artists but people in general you know they have they're, they're you know not just famous they're famous and they can have a lot of power with that going back to the royal bloods what i find really funny is uh, a couple of years ago at the brit awards maybe the one you were at they got oh, a, they got a brit one? award for best group and there's there's two of them okay and that that was hilarious and they went up on stage and they were just like yeah thanks do you know what i mean like that might have been the one that i was at that's ridiculous like best group there's just two of them. Like, give give them an award for you know best song or best breakthrough act. Do you know what best, I mean? Like, best don't... artist. I thought it would be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. Like best group. I thought that was a bit of a bit of a joke. Really, it was just. Like... I actually thought. I actually maybe maybe you're right. And I thought it was best upcoming artist. But yeah, you might be you might be right there. No, they were they were so weird. I, I was like I was great. laughing my ass off. I thought it was hilarious. Uh-huh. One award to get. <laughs> just two guys. I bet they found it quite funny. Yeah, they were kind of confused, but. <laughs> yeah, got got them out there, didn't it? So. Be like, there are some more people in our band. Where are these people? <laughs> what are your music career goals? Playing certain venues, festivals, playing with certain artists. Mm, like I think share the stage with. Oh, in terms of in terms of performing, I don't really have that much of a goal. <laughs> I guess my 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 main wish that I could do, I think, I always want to just go tour around the world. Like, I just want to go abroad and see different things and meet different people. I think I'm very much kind of like people person. I like to meet and talk to lots. I'm just chatty, chatty, talk to a lot of people. And I think it's a big kind of dream of mine to go, you know, on a plane from here to there, everywhere, performing, you know, all the time, like every day, going out, doing a show. So what, what, that's kind, of, what kind of countries would you really uh, like to go to and play? I'd love to tour around America. Um, you should just, maybe get in touch with Maria who has already done this podcast. Okay. Because she did a tour across the States and her music mm-hmm. paid for the petrol money and she just went across country, went rock climbing at the same time and then played, yeah, and played gigs at the places where, you know, where the rock, where the best rock climbing spots were and, and yeah, she basically funded the whole trip by herself and it sounded oh, amazing. Oh, really good. Yeah, so, oh. so maybe give her a message. And... Maria, Maria, Maria. <laughs> Okay. No, she that's sings that all the time as well. Does she? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's good. Yeah, no, I'll definitely definitely do that. Yeah, maybe you can sort out at all with her. That'd be awesome. But yeah, no, definitely countries like that. And I think I'd love to do, you know, just Europe and I like the kind of more I like countries like Bulgaria and Romania. I think there's such a strong divide between rich and poor there and it'd be great to do some charity shows there and just I just love the country itself. I think the food is great and the people are lovely and so yeah what advice would you give to up-and-coming musicians who are just starting out i would say who are just starting out make a plan but don't stick to that plan (laughs) i think it's so don't make a plan no i think you need to have a plan (laughs) but you need to allow that plan to mold and change okay you know it's very easy to throw yourself into these things and just you know do stuff i think if you want to take if you want to take it seriously i think you need to really study what other people have done and and really you know you need to think if you really seriously want to make it and i and this could be completely wrong because obviously i'm i'm just you know who i am as a performer um haven't made it in a in a such but i think you need to think of music half about half creatively and half business wise it's a horrible thing but it is a business in the end it is a business industry and it you know you can't just like we said earlier you can't just kind of spew out music all the time as easy as you know if you're if you're someone like prince and you can just write amazing songs all the time then by all means go for it but i think it's you know there's a bit more of a tack of a tact to it but that aside the whole business thing aside i think my other main tip would just be gig 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 just perform, perform, perform. You know, if it's to one person, you know, in a in a in a bar, you know, in a in a pub, just do it. Okay, just because it builds up experience. You never know that one old man sitting in the back could be, you know, the head of head honcho at a record label. You never know. Yeah, or if every, you could know every, someone who 
Yeah. Yeah. You just have to talk to people. Talk to people. Never, never um, invest your time. I think into one person unless you're unless you've been talking to them for a while and you're 100 percent sure but at the same time definitely keep your ear out and definitely touch base with a lot of people because you never know what can happen and i think you know bands you know some bands just gig 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 but they never release anything and other yeah. bands they they never gig but they release loads online and i yeah. think everything you do should have a nice balance to it i think you just need to work your ass off and just do what you love doing yeah, because there's some bands out there which, like you said, haven't really achieved as much as other bands. And some bands are obviously more prepared and they seem to just come out of nowhere and instantly have videos and EPs ready. And I think fair play to them because they are prepared. Yeah. They know what they want. They know what they want to achieve. And I there think are... some bands can just get lost in just playing endless tours. You'll be surprised that actually a lot of bands that come out and make it in the big leagues and you know are seen as more professional and they go to all the big festivals those bands are you know they've been gigging for a while they have maybe another band that they had before and a lot of music that they've written but not released and they basically will go to a managing company or a record label and you know touch base with them and hopefully get someone interested and then you know it could take a year it could take more where they just plan 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 get them you know in a you could write songs and record them go to somewhere and then they'll say this is great we're going to re-record you so it's really professional and do our own new project and invest our time and money into you and this can be from big league record companies to independent labels and then once that's all done and sorted like you said they'll just come out prepared with stuff and a lot of people you know they don't realize that you know a lot of hard work and graft goes into these things it doesn't just happen i think a lot of bands as well they'll they'll be you know doing all the right things they'll be gigging writing music releasing music they'll have a big fan base um but they they they, you know they'll be in the, they'll be the top of their league but their league will be amateur and it's kind of like and then they mm-hmm. expect and then they expect you know they say oh why aren't we getting these big slots on these festivals and it is it's a shame because people work really hard but there's just you know such a kind of roundabout way of doing things now you have to kind of know the right people and get in with the right people and you can't just sit in your backside waiting for it to happen no you i think can't. You, have to, you have to just keep keep get sending people emails and knocking on their front door and saying listen to this and and things like that and then you know yeah, and I, I think I've kind of found that out because obviously I, I sort of put myself out there, the festival where I met you. Obviously, I don't don't usually approach artists face to face. I have been sort of like just email based and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I'd say definitely just talk to everyone you can, and you never know. And yeah, you obviously agreed to come on the podcast, so say yes to everything because I'm yeah. talking, and you know. <laughs> it doesn't you know it's not it's not taking any more time out of my day you know i've got this slot free so why yeah. not is yeah, what I'm and I, I really really appreciate it like yeah it's it means a lot it's to me. great. i think it's great we're doing like talking to people is is great you know and I, i'm gonna have fun listening to all of the other podcasts as well <laughs> yes and obviously i have hollow star tomorrow as well coming down yeah. so that's gonna be a lot of they fun were awesome. they were awesome yeah at, they uh, they were so amazing when him, yeah him, that was good I think they someone, someone grabbed me from inside. They were like, come check out this band. They seemed really popular. I had someone yeah. else do that. That's why I stayed as well. And uh, mm. they, I had a chat with, uh, I think, a couple of the martyrs, and they seemed really nice, really cool guys. So you'll have fun talking yeah, to them definitely. tomorrow. It's kind of the last question now. So <laughs> what are some of your guilty pleasures? What, what do you secretly love to listen to that you don't kind of like to admit to people? Well, Like really hmm. cheesy music, maybe? Or like... Cheesy pop. I listen to everything, so I guess uh, you know a lot of people find different things cheesy. So it, whatever you think is cheesy, I've probably listened to it. Is what I'd say. Um, <laughs> but in the past, I have been very, very hooked to things like High School Musical. I was a massive fan of High School Musical. <laughs> that's so that's the type of cheese that I'm talking about. By, by by the last film, I hated it. It's the same yeah. thing with the Twilight Saga. I loved, mm. I read all the Twilight books because it's easy reading and I don't read that much. But they were really good books. And then they released the film, so I was so excited. And then by the last film, I was just like, mm. Yeah, they they had them on TV the other day and they played like 
one each night and I was just like, these films get worse every night. It's like these The last dreadful. film is ridiculous. I think the premise is great. The book the books I thought were fantastic. But in the last film just everyone just gets decapitated. It's just yeah, really oh, weird and they bad. Are, they are oh. dreadful films. But that's my guilt that's my main guilty pleasure. Away from music. It's just I just li- I just watch films all the time. Yeah. Shit ones, good ones, you know. <laughs> all of them. I just I just spend my whole life if I have a second, if I have a few hours, I'll watch a film. It sounds so. like you do not have that much time to do that. So <laughs> I usually just stay up at night. I'll, stay, I'll be, you know, up early in the morning, to bed really, really late. And then sometimes if I feel like torturing myself, I'll watch a film in the middle of the night with a cup of tea. And then my eye will start twitching the next day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. I'm, I'm really bad at that. That's what musicians do, you know, like creative yeah. people do, you know. We just stay up all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's usually when people are most creative as well. It's like really late hours. Do you find really, that? Really late, really late at night where you're sleep deprived and hallucinating. Yep. I think Aphex Twin did that a lot. Yeah. Or on the loo, you know, in the in the toilet. Apparently you think best when we need a wee and, you know, the acoustics are great. So <laughs> it's uh, each to their own. I say each to their I, own. I haven't tried that. Maybe I'll try that. I've only had a few ideas. Have an well. epiphany on the uh, toilet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to play one of your songs. Would you like to introduce it for us? Yes, so this is a song that is out on iTunes, Spotify, places like that. Uh, A song I wrote called Daydreamer. Your mind, it floats away, it isn't here to stay. It's off to find a dream or some distant memory Lights of fancy like a trance imagining a glow A natural spectacular flow Just give me a moment of fantasy letting go
thank you to my guest, Adieska. Thanks for getting my name right. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm terrible with names, really bad. Please like and share this show on Facebook. You can also follow me on facebook.com forward slash local distortion podcast and subscribe to my YouTube channel, search local distortion podcast, and it will come up straight away. Where can people follow you on social media? So everything's just dot com forward slash Adieska. So I've got uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Those are my main ones. Uh, I have my own website, just adieska.com. Um, you'll find most things on my website if you if you really need to find them, and they have links to other social media there as well. And if you're an up-and-coming artist or band or know someone who is, I'm always looking for future guests on the podcast, so please get in contact with me through the Local Distortion Facebook page. Thank you for listening. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we're done. Record time. Wow. In an hour. It was like exactly.